The subject of this video is the GDL82 installation process. In this second video in the GDL82 series, we'll discuss the GDL82 system installation process. And as with all videos in this series, this video is for training and familiarization only. Installers must reference the current revision of the GDL82 TSO install manual. That Garmin part number is 190-01810-00 for correct and complete procedures. Figure 2-1 from the installation manual shows the system interfaces. As you can see, the only connection to the existing transponder is the antenna coaxial lead. The coaxial cable from the L-band antenna is also connected to the GDL82. Other connections to the GDL82 include power and ground, optional discrete inputs, and either a GPS antenna or a GPS source input, depending on the model of the GDL82 being installed. You also see here a USB connection that's used to connect the PC config tool. The USB interface is necessary for system software uploads and installation configuration as well as the troubleshooting. We'll discuss these features in the future videos in this series. As the system interface's schematic illustrates, the physical installation of the GDL82 will not be an overly complex process. We're basically placing a new device between the existing transponder and the L-band antenna and either connecting an existing GPS source or installing a GPS antenna to provide for the optional internal GPS. As we emphasized in the previous video in this series, there is a critical first step that must be conducted before you do any component removal or wire and cable cutting. The pre-installation transponder check described in section 4.2 of the manual must be conducted to verify the existing transponder meets the minimum performance requirements to be compatible with the GDL82 installation. The existing transponder needs to be tested for peak output power and receiver sensitivity. This is due to the GDL82 introducing up to a 1.5 dB loss in the transmission line throughput at the existing transponder antenna. This step will typically be accomplished by a field shop with access to a transponder ramp tester. Once the input parameters are verified, you can then proceed on your own with the installation of the GDL82. If the results of the transponder pre-installation check do not meet the minimum performance standards as shown in the table, several steps may be taken to remedy that situation. These steps are listed as a note to section 4.2. Now we'll look at the materials and tools that are needed for our installation as shown in section 3.1 of the installation manual. In table 3-1 we see part numbers shown for the two available GDL82 versions one with an internal GPS module, and one without. As the note below this table points out, the standard kit for either unit includes a connector kit, and if you order the GDL82 with an internal GPS, the kit will include a GA35 antenna. The next table shows the connector kit part number. In table 3-3, you'll see the wire gauge recommended for the pins supplied for the connector. The gauge rating is between 22 and 28. The connector pin part numbers compatible with the connector housing are also shown in this table. Table 3-4 lists the Garmin GA35 GPS antenna needed if installing the GDL82 with an internal GPS. Again, this comes in the standard kit if that version of the GDL82 was ordered. There is also a part number shown for an alternate brand of compatible antenna. Below this table is a note that an antenna doubler may be required, depending on the type of antenna installed. Now we look at section 3.2 concerning optional accessories. The table shown here lists optional accessories that you may need depending upon the specifics of your installation. The list includes enunciators in two different voltages as well as BNC and TNC type connectors. Another optional part that you may need is the GPS notch filter, which would be required if a GDL82 with internal GPS experiences interference from other radios installed in the aircraft. Section 3.3 details materials which are required but not supplied by Garmin. On the list is wire, shielded wire, mounting screws, circuit breaker if not using the existing one for the transponder, tie wraps or lacing cord, ring terminals, coaxial cable, and a USB-A to a USB-B cable to connect the PC to the GDL82 for the use with the install tool. Next is section 3.4, which details special tools required for the building of the harness. 
The first tool listed is a milliometer. This is used for performing continuity as well as power and grounding checks. Subsection 3.4.2 describes crimp tools, positioners, and extraction tool part numbers and types. Six different tools are in the list. Each of these will have a positioner listed to support proper crimping of the pins in the GDL82 connector. There are also recommended insertion and extraction tools for each manufacturer. Many of these are the same part number since they are all supporting the same pin type. Subsection 3.4.3 lists necessary test equipment for pre- and post-checks of the installation. You'll need a ground power source capable of powering the entire aircraft system and a transponder ramp tester that's required to do testing before and after the installation of the GDL-82. In addition, an ADSB test set is required if the transponder ramp tester is not capable of receiving the UAT frequency of 978 MHz and decoding ADSB messages. You can use a Garmin GDL39 in a tablet or phone using the Garmin Pilot application. This will receive the UAT transmissions and allow you to view the various parameters of the broadcast. Now we proceed to Section 4 for installation planning and considerations. The first section here covers installation requirements. This short section details the requirements for a minimum installation. Devices include a Mode A, Mode C, Atcrabs transponder, L-band antenna, and a GDL-82 with a GPS, SBAS, or WAS position source. Next is Section 4.2, Pre-Installation Transponder Check, which we've already reviewed as the critical first step in this process, so we'll move on to Section 4.3. Section 4.3 lists GDL-82 external sensors and devices. Since ADSB out transmissions require the highly accurate position information derived from GPS SBAS receptions, that it's a required input to the GDL-82. There are several approved sources listed in this section, such as the Garmin devices and their minimum software revision levels. This list is provided in case the installation doesn't have a compatible existing position source. One of the possibilities is the GDL-82 with the internal GPS receiver. Section 4.4 deals with antenna requirements. The beginning note discusses the electrical and physical requirements for the antenna, as well as the applicable TSO categories. There's also a note concerning antenna location, which is an important consideration to reduce interference. Table 4-2 lists acceptable L-band antennas. Some are listed as open circuit and others are shown as a DC short. Either of these is acceptable as the design will appear as a 50 ohm impedance at the frequency of 978 MHz. The GDL82 will function properly with any of these antennas, but take note that some of the listed antennas are designated as not recommended for new installations. The next subsection is 4.4.2, which provides a list of acceptable GPS antennas in Table 4-3. All of these antennas are compatible electrically. Some are stocked with a Garmin part number. The Comat antennas are not stocked by Garmin and only show the manufacturer's part number. All have TNC connectors for the GPS cable. Some are dual or triple purpose antennas adding VHF as well as XM antenna functionality in the same package. Section 4.5 covers antenna mounting location possibilities for the L-band and the GPS antennas. In subsection 4.5.1, L-band antenna location recommendations are discussed. The guidance provided states that it's best to locate the GDL-82 as close to the L-band antenna as possible to reduce the length of coaxial cable. This helps offset the 1.5 dB loss in the GDL-82. Subsection 4.5.2 provides guidance for selecting an optimal location for the GPS antenna installation. Because it may not be possible to meet all of these guidelines, Garmin has listed them in order of importance to achieve optimum performance. There are seven recommendations in the list arranged by order of importance. They discuss level antenna mounting, positioning to minimize shadowing, minimum distance to the VHF comm antenna, distance to antennas transmitting greater than 25 watts power, minimum distance to other antennas to reduce shadowing, minimum distance to the windscreen, and minimum distance to another GPS antenna. The advice given in this subsection reflects the intent of AC 20-138D Section 16. It's suggested to adhere to the guidelines as closely as possible when installing the antenna to guarantee the best signal acquisition 
and reception. The next section, section 4.6, discusses interference considerations. First, a caution about not using ground-based cell phones and the conditions for their utilization. Then there's a caution about non-aviation radios, such as marine transceivers, causing interference in navigation equipment. It's up to the installer to check operation with other equipment to verify if interference does exist. If any is determined, recommendations for eliminating it are given. These possibilities include relocating antennas, rerouting cables, installing filters to reduce harmonics radiated from other equipment, and, if all else fails, removing the device producing the interference and replacing it with a model that doesn't cause the interference. Now we move to Section 5, covering connector pinouts. Section 5.1 deals with the J821 connector on the GDL82. Figure 5-1 shows the connector shape and pin location when looking at the unit. Next is the table 5-1, which provides the pinout of the DB15 connector. This gives us the pin number, pin name, and I.O. direction for each pin. In the note following the table, we see an explanation of the discrete inputs. The active and inactive states are defined as voltage levels and DC resistance to ground. The next section is 5.2, Functional Descriptions. Subsection 5.2.1 discusses power and antennas. In this section, you'll find Table 5-2, which provides a description of power input requirements and antenna connectors. Below that is Table 5-3, which lists the antenna connector labels that are stamped into the unit near each port. Subsection 5.2.2 discusses RS-232 serial connections. Table 5-4 lists the RS-232 receive and transmit ports for the GDL-82. Subsection 5.2.3 shows the discrete input connections. Table 5-5 lists the discrete inputs. Those are the squat switch and the anonymous mode switch. The squat switch discrete, if installed, tells the unit how to report the air and ground state of the aircraft. The anonymous mode switch, if installed, allows the unit to be placed into the anonymous mode. Next is subsection 5.2.4 covering the discrete output. Table 5-6 shows the fault alert connector, pin, and I.O. direction. Table 5-7 discusses the fault alert function states of active and inactive. In the active state, the enunciator lamp will illuminate to show that the system is not transmitting all FAA-required ADSB data. Subsection 5.2.5 defines the time mark inputs in Table 5-8. These are timing inputs from an external position source. Section 6.1 covers cabling and wiring general instructions. The first line is a caution to remind you to verify there are no wiring errors, as these could cause component damage. The note is a reminder about keeping shield connections as short as possible. We're reminded of Advisory Circular AC 43.13-1B Chapter 11, which defines the general wiring practices associated with avionics. The list of precautions starts by reminding us to be careful of locating cables near control surfaces and cables, or near high voltage, electrical noise sources, or fuel lines. Next, we're reminded to locate cables in a protected area. Use proper wire gauge, route and secure wire bundles properly, avoid sharp bends and chafing points, and keep pigtail lengths less than 3 inches. Subsection 6.6.1 defines shielded cable preparation. It addresses the proper method for stripping the jacket and preparing the braid for shield termination. There is a preferred method using a solder sleeve on the braid. Also, there is an alternate method given using shrink tubing. We are reminded to repeat the methods discussed for all remaining shielded cables. Subsection 6.1.2 gives us pin crimping instructions for the wiring. We're given stripping dimensions and how to crimp the pin on the exposed wire. A diagram with measurements also illustrates the dimensions. Subsection 6.1.3 discusses the jack screw back shell assembly. You'll note two caution statements here. The first caution concerns the strain relief clamp. It can be mounted two ways. The incorrect way places the concave side against the wire bundle with the sharp edges of the clamp against the wires. Eventually, this will chafe and wear through the wire's insulation, causing failures. Be sure to orient the smooth side down toward the wires to avoid this problem. The second caution concerns proper orientation of the connector on the GDL-82. 
In assembling the back shell, threaded holes are provided to connect the ring terminals on the cable shields. Parameters are given for proper attachment of these terminals. You're reminded to apply silicon fusion tape around the wire bundle for further protection of the harness under the strain relief clamp. Assembly of the connector and back shell are detailed in this section. Figure 6-3 gives a pictorial three-dimensional drawing of the back shell with numbers linking the parts to the text describing the entire assembly. Section 6.2 details coaxial cable assembly and installation. The first thing we see here is a note advising us that older coaxial cables, such as RG58, may need to be replaced with a newer type due to cable loss issues. The instructions tell us to use a double-shielded 50-ohm coaxial cable with appropriate insertion loss based on the length of our installation. Connectors, such as TNC or BNC, will be selected based on the type of cable needed. The connectors using BNC types are labeled on the GDL82. Be careful to connect the correct cable to the labeled port on the unit, as they can easily be reversed. If there is an onboard GPS receiver, this antenna connection will require a threaded TNC cable connection instead of the BNC bayonet type. Be particularly careful with assembly of the coaxial cable connector so as not to develop a short from the center conductor to the shield. Damage to the GPS receiver, the GDL82, or the transponder may result if this is not checked. Use an ohmmeter to verify before connecting and applying power. Keep in mind some of the transponder antennas may show up as a DC short, so measure the cable before connecting. See Table 6-1 for the coaxial cable specifications of cables compatible with the GDL82. Following that, Table 6-2 details cable connector loss. And Table 6-3 details acceptable GPS decibel loss in the installation. It's important to adhere to losses in this range to provide proper input signal level to the GPS receiver. Anything outside this range may render the GPS unable to use the signal. Section 6.3 states that the GDL82 is mounted with four 6 seconds inch mounting screws and self-locking nuts using the dimensions shown in Section 9 to prepare mounting holes. Section 6.4 deals with GPS antenna installation and connections. This installation information pertains to the GDL82 units with the GPS option, and it also meets the guidance provided in AC 20-138D, which defines guidelines for global navigation satellite system equipment. Subsection 6.4.1 discusses the GPS antenna installation procedure in detail, and we're referred to Section 4.5.2, which shows installation location possibilities. Before permanently mounting the GPS antenna, place it temporarily in the desired location and check satellite reception using procedures described in Section 8.1.1. If the signal strength is adequate in the chosen position, it can be permanently mounted there. This section also details the type and length of cable to be used to get the proper attenuation of the antenna signal going to the GPS receiver, and we are advised to use low-loss double or triple shielded 50-ohm coax cable if the cable length will exceed 35 feet. Each antenna will come with a set of installation instructions pertaining to that type of antenna, so be sure to become familiar with those instructions. Also take note of figure 6-4, which shows the minimum ground plane radius. And finally, section 6.4.2 discusses the GPS antenna doubler plate. This short section discusses the mounting techniques for mounting the GPS antenna using the doubler plate. And as a last step, be sure to connect the coaxial cable to the antenna. That's it. Now you've become familiar with the GDL82 installation procedures. Next up in this series is our video about the GDL8X install tool software. Thanks for watching and buying Garmin.